Hola, Marita. Hola, querida. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Y tú, querida Ana, cómo vas? Bien, ya le hice seminario, por si acaso ya se conecta Dorian. Ah, ya, buenísimo. Eh, ¿Qué tenemos pendiente? ¿De, de esto? Uh -huh. ¿Solamente tú le presentas? Sí, yo le presento y luego hacemos la serie de preguntas contigo. Ya. ¿Te parece? Sí. Y luego las dos, ahí podemos decirlas, no te preocupes. Ya, buenas. Ahora las de, ahí hay algunos participantes. Estaba compartiendo en mis múltiples alcances whatsappeños. Sí, yo también, todo listo, todo lo que pueda. Oye, eh, ¿qué te iba a decir? Hable, tenemos que hablar esta semana que viene o algo para ver cómo vamos a estructurar, ¿viste? Ese, ese call for proposals que mandó el Cristian. Uh -huh. eh, sí, sí. The drawing. Sí, sería buenazo. A ver, cuando yo me puedo reunir, ¿te vas a algún lado feriado o no? Sí, voy a Bahía, pero por Zoom puedo. Ya, ahí, ahí hablemos para, para ver si, si conversamos un ratito y vemos si, si mandamos el, un abstract. Eso, sí, sí. Buenazo. Igual estar poniendo sí, un buenazo. poco de de temas o de líneas que nos, que nos vayan interesando. Sería buenazo ya hacer eso. Ya buenazo, me parece siempre. Eh, los afiches está recogiendo el Juanito hoy día porque imprimió en un papel que se le cortó y se le juntó toda la tinta. Mentira. Tuvo que volver a imprimir y recién ayer, tipo 12, estaba cortando. ¿Y te mandó sí. fotos de cómo quedaron? ¿Cómo sabemos? Sí, sí me mandó, pero medias lejos. Apenas sí, te... Sí, decía, qué te... raro, ¿por qué? Ajá, ¿por qué no nos da? Yo decía, ¿qué, ¿qué habrá pasado? No sé. Y me dijo, ay, gracias por tu paciencia. Por ahí te mando los voice notes también de él. Así que. Ah, ya está Dorian. Le voy a aceptar, ¿ya? Ya vi. Hi. Hi, Dorian. Welcome. Hi, Dorian. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, so this is nice. Um, my first time virtually anyway in uh, Quito, Ecuador. <laughs> so thank you for the invitation. No, thank you for, for being here. It's like it, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, we, we, we have known your work and uh, regarding the, the topic drawing uh, as as a way to see the future, uh, we thought it would be great to have you here. So thank you so much for accepting. Um, uh, we, we will start, at, I think, at 11.05, around 11.05, so that all, all the students can get into the seminar. They are starting to get in right now. I don't know if you want to try something, or do you have sound or something like that in your presentation? Uh, well, I, I, I have a PDF, so I, I'll try share my screen and see if that works. Uh, okay, give me one second. I'll, I'll allow it. Okay, now you can share it. So let's see. So can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I do that, can you also see it? No, it didn't change. It hasn't changed? No. No. We're seeing your full screen at the moment. Okay. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe it doesn't share PDFs very well. Um, so let me try that again. Yikes. Um, is that sharing? Yeah, yeah. I think that's better. That's yeah. perfect. So, so we see like black and black, and then it's a long screen, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And can you see? It? 
Can you see it changing? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes yeah. now, now it's working, yeah. Okay, good. So, okay, so that's how I should present then. Um, let's see if I can get this. Um, Yeah, and yeah, that works. That's good. Yeah, yeah, it's working. I think maybe it's not working anymore. Ah, um, okay. Yeah, it's changing. I think it's working. Okay, it's just the method of changing. It's not changing using the keys that I'm I'm used oh. to. So it changes using my mouse for some reason. <laughs> okay, but I may get this wrong <laughs> from time to time, go backwards rather than forwards or forwards rather than backwards. But we'll see. So that's going forwards, and all of that is visible, yeah? Yeah, everything is visible. Okay, and I, I suppose a question would be good to ask, um, although it's too late because I prepared my presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so to whom am I speaking? Am I speaking to undergraduates or postgraduates? Um, uh, staff or a mix? I think, uh, well, it's a mix. It's an open um, a seminar. So uh, I think you're going to be speaking mostly to student, undergrad students, but mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, professors, teachers, uh, I don't know, any, everybody that is interested in, I think, in drawing and in design in general. So you will be speaking to a broad audience, but the majority will be undergrad students. Okay, okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I may be pitching it a little bit too high, but we will see. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry. But I, I, I have a theory that, um, or a principle that uh, we should never talk down to undergraduates anyway. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, of so, course. Exactly. So we'll aim high and see what happens. Um, and, and so I kind of guess what I'm planning is something like um, maybe maximum speaking for an hour, but it may... It may be a little bit less and maybe a little bit more if that's okay. Um, yeah, don't worry. I, yeah, okay. And then I, I'm assuming that there'll be some questions. Yeah, yes. so, okay. Yeah, Marisa, go. <laughs> I will be posing the questions, Dorian. Um, okay. And uh, we will be collecting the questions in the Q&A or in the chat um, and then uh, answering at the end of your lecture. Um, so, I don't know if, uh, like, if you can open the Q and A in the chat below. You could also perhaps uh, read the questions as I pose them. Uh, but it'll be like a conversation, more like. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, I can put in some of my questions uh, as well, <laughs> embedded within the ones that the, that the public uh, uh, wants to get uh, some feedback. I, so. I, I that's that's all at the end, yeah. Rather than in, in between, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I think it's great. We have like an hour and a half, uh, uh, even two hours, but it will be great if you can talk uh, as as you said so, like around I don't know an hour or less, and then we will read the questions and it will be like more like a conversation, as Marisa said. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Good. I look forward to it immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, students are um, also a professional degree. So when they graduate, they are architects. Um, so uh, it's sort of this uh, a longer span. They they um, and so your aim at uh, to, you know elevating sort of the discourse is about right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, I mean, I, I generally teach uh, postgrad um, at my school, but um, I do um, deliver undergraduate dissertations, so I speak to them. But I, I, I have um, taught in undergraduate many, many times, uh, and for a long time as well as postgraduate. But my, my time these days is principally postgraduate so I may have forgotten how to speak to, to undergraduates um, <laughs> but but we will see 
And anyway, I, I, I think people often said to me that when I did teach undergraduate, I sounded as if I was talking to postgraduates anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, maybe things haven't changed. Um, yeah, but the, th but the reality is though, um, I am a professional architect also. Um, and um, uh, of course I was a student of architecture once myself. <laughs> That's great. That's that's what we wanted, you know, to have these like very, you know, merging worlds sort of in this conversation and in, in, in the series mm -hmm. uh, of conversations that we've been having has been in that sense of like seeing architecture from another perspective, but yet uh, we all like have a little bit of architecture in our bodies. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So Dorian, have you been to South America? I have never been to South America, no. Well, well next yeah, time we'll have to have you. Yeah, yeah be it's great, the one though. continent that I haven't been to. You have to yeah. come down. <laughs> I know now, I, nowadays is a bit enough. difficult. Yeah, I know at the moment it is a bit tricky. But then one of the good things is that um, the technology advanced rapidly mm -hmm. to enable this, for example. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, especially here in South America, I think that uh, it forced us to, I don't know, to to seek these new types of, of teaching, of conversations, of, of technology being like inserted into education. We, were, we weren't like this. And I think that COVID uh, forced us to do this. So it was like a positive side especially here uh, in, in, I think, in the region. So mm. it's great to, as you said, to be able to, to do this right now. Yeah, yeah. And it's quite nice to know that. I mean, so we um, obviously being in Scotland, uh, mm -hmm. which compared to you very far north, um, and, and we're entering um, the winter via autumn at the moment. So uh, there's a, a, a very specific difference between where we are here and where you are yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so as I'm looking out my window here, you can't see this, but it's already beginning to get dark uh, <laughs> because it's oh, approaching. It's five, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it's the end of my teaching day today and you're, you're at the beginning, aren't you? Yeah. Well, we're in the middle. Like, Mid like, right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's 11 a.m. for us at the moment. Yeah, and, and, and one thing I was thinking just uh, earlier today that, uh, of course, you in Ecuador, you probably do not get uh, the seasons in the way that we do. No, we, we actually have like two seasons, like winter and summer. Yeah. Uh, yes. And they don't change that much. The difference is that it rains a lot or it's a little bit drier. Right, so, so you're, you're entering the dry season then? No, we're entering the, the winter right now where it's raining. Oh, really? Are oh, you right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. right. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, so I didn't know that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yes, because so we're in the middle. Yeah, we're not south. If it was south, we were entering the summer. Yeah, and, 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 mm -hmm. but of course, you're equatorial though, right? So you're... you're mm -hmm. um, so I, I've been doing a lot of work in India. Um, so I've been uh, used to uh, dealing now with the that which is not temperate, right? Um, so the temperate conditions of Europe, which is what I'm used to um, on a day-to-day -day basis, gets challenged every time I go to India. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Anna, do you wanna start? Yes, I think we can start now. Um, so we, we don't take much of, of, of your time, Dorian. So okay. uh, let me share screen so I can introduce everybody. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody uh, to the fourth ses session of the lecture series, uh, Drawing the Future Visions of Architectures to Come. To have, uh, today we have Dorian uh, Wisniewski, I don't know if I pronounced it right. Okay. But uh, uh, from the University of Edinburgh and drawing on. Uh, we're going to start with Dorian's presentation. Uh, please feel free to send all your questions to the Q&A uh, window and we will address them once the lecture is over. 
Um, I will introduce now to our guest. Uh, Dr. Dorian is a senior academic in, in the Edinburgh School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, ESALA, Edinburgh College of Art, Ed University of Edinburgh, and partner in the Shisky uh, Samsung Architect, uh, WCA. Uh, build and project work has been published in ex uh, and exhibited nationally and internationally. Amongst many awards, uh, WCA won the Royal Scottish Academy Medal in Architecture in 2006. He leads various uh, uh, PG programs in Isala, Master of Architecture, Master in Sire, Science, Architectural and Urban Design, a PhD Architectural by Design. Academic papers have been published widely internationally. Students have won multiple national and international awards. Academic output currently focuses on design-led research and processes of urbanization, particularly through the paired architectural and philosophical questions of socioeconomic representation and production. He was, visit he was visiting professor for architecture and urban planning at the University of Sassari in Sardinia, and for architecture and urban design in uh, Hebei University of Technology in Tianjin, China. He was a director of the Asia Scottish Scotland Trust and a board member for architecture and design in Scotland. In 2014, Dorian and PhD students founded and act as editors for Drawing On, a peer review international e-journal that acts as a platform for developing topics associated with a, 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 or addressed through design-led research into architecture. It is currently on edition four. Welcome, Dorian. It's an honor uh, to have you here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I look forward to taking questions at the end. And hopefully the presentation I deliver um, can appeal to different members of the audience, whether they're undergraduate, postgraduate, professional, fellow academics, or even just lay people who are interested in uh, research by design. Um, so I'll share my screen and then I'll just go straight into my presentation if that's okay. So hopefully that's all very clear. Yeah, it's clear. Okay, and just checking again, it's moving, yeah. We can see the slides moving. Okay, good. So, okay, so my presentation is going to be in two parts, a very brief uh, introductory part on drawing on um, to tell a little bit about drawing on. Um, and then the second part, I'm going to um, speak about um, a specific aspect of research by design. Uh, I'll elaborate that in a second, but drawing on, um, which I guess is one of the, the, the principal reasons I've been asked to present. Um, so you see the web address drawingon.org. Um, so please go visit that website and play around in it. Um, I forewarn you there are some uh, technical glitches because we just uh, changed our server recently and there are two errors that come up on the screen, but uh, they just they become a little bit annoying, but just ignore them and go through. The website still works mostly, um, um, but it's undergoing some technical um, reconstruction at the moment. So I'll tell you a little bit about that in a, in a second. Um, but the second aspect of the presentation, um, uh, which is going to be the longer part of the presentation, I, I've decided that um, maybe what might be quite interesting is to theorize research by design. Um, and to offer um, specific insights into specific aspects of research by design. Um, and so therefore this, this second part of the um, presentation is going to talk about research by design as a trans-historical modality. And I'm going to spe speak specifically about the notion of gesture. Um, and I'll touch on other references which are important to this idea, which are Denk Builder. Uh, I'll explain what all these are in due course, movement images and thought forms. And I'm going to do that around um, a paper that I presented um, and pub got published. Well, actually, I presented the paper a few times in different uh, venues, but it was published in the Nordic Journal of Architectural Research. Um, and so you, therefore you can read that 
also that's available online um, and um, it's important it's in, published in the Nordic Journal of Research, Architectural Research, is because it's about a, a, a Finnish designer. So um, the reason I'm talking about a Finnish architect is partly because of my historical interest in this architect, but also because this architect has built something in India, and India has been the site of um, my research for the last eight years. Um, so. Um, it's got multiple aspects of interest to me. And anyway, so it's published, so therefore, no matter what I say today, um, you can go and research it further by looking up uh, this, this journal. So anyway, so coming on to Drawing On. Um, so Drawing On is an e-journal, um, as was mentioned in the introduction. It's, it was set up by myself and some of my PhD architecture by design students. And what we wanted it to be was a platform for developing topics associated with or addressed through design-led research into architecture. And we had two ambitions really uh, in setting this up. One was um, to create a platform to, for all, all those research by designers out there to come together and um, have a medium in which they can present their work. There's not many vehicles, uh, in fact, when we started our journal there were no vehicles at all um, where um, you could publish research by design because most publication tries to um, uh, advance the text and limit the drawings and that's obviously historically because of publication costs printing costs etc but because we're an e-journal um, we don't have those issues we don't need printing costs and we don't have to stick to um, the time frames of getting things printed so we can keep adding to our uh, journal as and when papers come in. So the second uh, aspiration for this journal was to act as a survey mechanism to survey all the discourse out there uh, on research by design. So we're contributing to the discourse, but also monitoring and recording the discourse. So that was the aspiration. Um, and so far, so good. I think we can say it's going quite well. Um, and so these are the editors. So I think it's important to um, acknowledge the editorial board. Um, so just going left to right, top to bottom is Costas Avramidis, Sophia Banu, uh, Costas currently teaches in uh, Cyprus. Sophia Banu teaches in um, uh, the west of England. Um, uh, Sebastian Edo is South American. Um, and um, at the moment, I'm not sure where he is. <laughs> um, but um, he was quite recently in Edinburgh, but I think he's on his way back to South America. So he may well be. Um, and I think um, Sebastian comes from Peru. Um, so uh, we have a Peruvian editor um, and we have then Chris French, uh, who teaches with me in Edinburgh. And in the bottom, we have Piotr Leshniak, who teaches in Glasgow. And we have Maria Mitsula, uh, who did teach for a while in Edinburgh, but is now teaching um, part time in Newcastle and is a nomadic scholar. And then, of course, there's me. Um, and we have a, an international set of peer reviewers. So our journal is internationally uh, double blind peer reviewed, but these are the people who would do that blind peer review. Um, so if you're to be published with us, um, two of these people would read every paper. Um, so I think I'd like to list all of them, actually, uh, because it would give a flavour of um, the nature of our review board. Um, how high a calibre it is and how international it is. So we have, first of all, uh, Ella Shmilevska, Mark Dorian and myself, and we are all in Edinburgh, um, so three colleagues in Edinburgh. Then moving along, we have um, Yorhia Manapalu, um, who is from London in uh, UK. Alessandro Melis, who is Italian, but uh, operating from New York um, in the USA. Juliana Preston, who is uh, from New Zealand. Uh, Tatiana Schneider, who's operating from Germany. 
Um, Richard Blythe, who's uh, operating from Virginia, USA. Uh, Mark Boomister uh, from the Netherlands. Nat Chard from London, uh, UK. Roger Conner, Connor, who was recently operating from Carlton in Canada. Sandra KJ Grady, who's from Queen, Queensland, Australia. Tal Kaminer, who's operating from Cardiff, Wales. Robert Kirkbride, who's operating from Parsons, New York. Perry Cooper, who's operating from Michigan, uh, USA. Mark Schunderbeek from Delft, uh, the Netherlands. Naomi Stead from Australia. Uh, Maria um, Theodoru, uh, who's operating from London. Stephen Walker, who's from Manchester uh, in England. Isabel Doucet, who's from Gothenburg, operating from Gothenburg in Sweden. Nick Dunn, who's Lancaster, UK. Helen Frischow, who's from um, Stockholm in Sweden. And uh, Penelope Harambilu, who's also from London uh, in the UK. So we've got a very um, I think uh, admirable and um, profound set of scholars who contribute to our journal and uh, we're very thankful to them because our project started with myself and some of my PhD students. All of these PhD students have now graduated, are now academics in their own right, but we maintain the journal um, in the editorial form. And we leave it open to any current PhD students who are on program to operate from time to time as um, editors. Um, so the, the project has grown from an in-house um, University of Edinburgh journal to an autonomous uh, international publication. So uh, as um, was pointed out, we are on uh, issue four at the moment. And um, we initially tried to um, publish uh, every two years, um, noting that um, the process of um, publi publishing our, um, our work, um, where uh, it takes quite a long time to edit things online and get things online. Um, so actually it's prone to a little bit of drift in time, um, but um, it's great that we've got uh, four um, editions, uh, three editions currently online and the fourth one is currently being worked on and we've got maybe about 30 articles currently online including the introductory texts and we'll have another 10 probably after edition four. And they operate to different themes. Um, and we tend to introduce every theme and every edition with um, um, a guest contribution. So in this one, for example, was uh, an interview with Alexander Broski by um, Mark Dorian um, uh, and my uh, teaching colleague, but also um, a fellow peer uh, reviewer. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so it's very nice to have these kind of papers um, setting up the aspiration for the particular edition. And so with the three editions we've had, um, what we tend to do is um, make all the articles available in different formats. So you can download a conventional article. So these are examples. So these would be the PDF downloads. They're all covered like this. So we have, for example, these three examples from three different um, editions. And in the website, there's a gallery, so you can actually view all the drawings and it allows you to zoom in and zoom out. Um, I would risk doing this on the website at the moment, but I don't want to risk breaking links uh, on Zoom because I know it's notorious for uh, not accepting complicated presentations. Um, but if you play on the website, you'll find that there's a gallery and you can zoom into all the drawings. And we also can therefore host films. And um, I think that's a really important uh, medium. So you could say that what Research by Design does is offer a medium through which image and text cooperate, but we never um, subjugate image to text or text to image. So there's a, a very important scholarly relationship between the two where 
drawings are allowed to open up research as much as theoretical ideas that are more conventionally researched through text. And I'm going to finish this part of the presentation to get on to the more substantive part of the presentation now, but I, I thought I would leave this part of the presentation with a quotation uh, from Mark Boomister's um, paper, The Body of the Shadow, towards a meta-medial framework. Um, I, I kind of want to give an idea that um, how rich some of this research is um, and how the research by design is um, a, a mediation of the thought and the process of drawing um, through different uh, uh, media. And Mark's website, once you get onto his article, you see there's a lot of film footage and there's some, some nice text, but he makes this very nice contribution, which echoes actually something of my own research, and that's why I'm quoting it at the moment. So I'm going to read the quotation that he quotes from uh, Felix Guattari, so Felix Guattari, a very uh, important um, rad radical uh, psychoanalyst for, um, who worked uh, with uh, philosopher uh, Gilles Deleuze. So anyway, he says, the decisive factor, it seems to me, is the general inflexibis inflexibility of social and psychological praxis, their failure to adapt, as well as a widespread incapa incapacity to perceive the erroneous of partitioning of the real into a number of separate fields. It is quite simply wrong to regard action on the psyche, the socius and environment as separate. We need to apprehend the world through the inter interchangeable lenses of the three ecologies. So i.e. what uh, Guattari is saying is that the mind, the body, society and the environment are quite often researched separately as separate categories, whereas in fact they are three ecologies which are interchangeable and this is a really important thing from a design point of view because we can draw what we our mind and body operates we can draw what we understand as the apparatus of society and we can draw the environment all as the same thing not necessarily as three separate things and i think maybe uh that is what uh, mark is confirming when he says the practice of research is, just as the theory of design, not to be arrested and forced into any pre-given form or methodology. Rather, research through design, given its ability to address both the affective and the tangible equally, is the quintessential strategy to transform methodological limit into essential heuristic ingenuity. So, i.e., design is as much about creating a means through which you can learn so that's what he that's what we really mean by design as research when you design as research you're drawing with a view to learning not necessarily with a view to uh, proclaiming how brilliant you are or how convinced you are about the truth of the world but really simply to understand more about what you think and how to think. So design is heuristic and we need to think about it that way. Okay, so that's a, a little bit on drawing on. And now I'm going to um, operate a more dense part of theory, but I hope with um, a sort of conventional aspect to this, because I, I, I'm going to talk about a building. I'm going to talk about a building as a drawing and um, drawings uh, of buildings as buildings. And I'm going to talk about drawings as um, a research vehicle. And I'm going to do that through this um, um, reference to um, this um, rather brilliant architect um, who's relatively unknown. Um, and I talk principally through this one building, um, and this is the um, the uh, Finnish embassy in New Delhi in India by an architect called Rima Pietila. Uh, Rima Pietila worked with his wife uh, Raila Pietila, um, but uh, Raila Pietila acknowledged that Rima uh, was the design force and um, 
she was happy to accept the the uh, the role of helping his practice rather than authoring his practice. So, for those that know Rima and Rila uh, Pietila, um, I'm not ignoring ignoring Rila, the wife. I'm actually uh, acknowledging that she's an intrinsic part of this. But uh, Rima Pietila is the the principal author author of this thinking. So when I'm talking about this project, um, I'm going to open up three strands of research of research by design. I'm going to open up Rima Pietila's research by design. I'm going to open up my own research by design. And I'm going to open up um, Roger Connor's research by design. Roger Connor, who is also on our uh, review board, is an important person um, in the life of uh, Rima Pietila because um, Connor worked with uh, Pietila for um, 12 years and has been spoken of as uh, Pietila's amenuensis. So what we mean by that is archivist, his research archivist. Um, and so I've been very fortunate, uh, although Pietila has, has died, um, I was very fortunate to become friends with Roger Connor and um, have got this very first-hand um, relationship with the drawings of Pietila, uh, partly due to uh, Roger's input. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about then the drawings and buildings as gestures and thought forms. Uh, thought form is my own term. Uh, nobody uses that. I'm using that. Um, and I think of drawings and buildings as thought forms. Uh, hopefully it will become clear what I mean by thought forms. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Pietel, who's a, a, a Finnish designer, um, working through research by design. Um, and I'll give a, a little introduction to his work through that building. Um, and this presentation is a sort of reduced summary version of the paper that I spoke about in the Nordic Journal of Architectural Research. And um, what I'm really going to be talking about then is uh, design as a montage theory of knowledge. Um, so knowledge where um, rather than thinking of think of it as a totality, um, knowledge is this limitless montage of one thing being added to another to another to another and quite often in different orders. So research in itself um, is also therefore a montage theory of knowledge. That's what I'm arguing. Okay, so I, I, I want to start with this little reference uh, to Susan Stewart's book, The Poet's Freedom. So, look, yeah, I mean, it's very clear that um, we can um, um, invoke the liberty given to the poet or the artist when it comes to design. And what um, Susan Stewart points out is that um, a lot of this um, distinction, if you like, between the poet, the artist and the scientist is an ancient division that is wrong, actually. And, um, and it's because of those early entrenchments of um, the, the the poetic thinking and the scientific thinking um, where the poet is supposed to be this kind of um, emotional person and the scientist is supposed to be this rational person. It's that division is um, not the, 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 the thing that um, we accept as research by designers. However, there is some truth in it. That's the point. There is a, there is a freedom in the, poet that is the same the very same freedom in the scientist and the way that the scientist researches and the way that the poet researches the artist researches really needs that freedom and so it's the second quotation here which catches that there so until reaching the brink of realized form so as architects if you like the drawing once the drawing is produced the maker proceeds by gestures of free choosing and free willing that find their motives and explanations only retrospectively, i.e. 
You can never know in advance. You can only know in the process of learning. So how, can, how is it possible to know in advance? There's no such thing. So only once the drawing is undertaken, can you begin to know. And so it's this knowing in succession so this montage theory of knowledge that I'm talking about is one drawing upon another, upon another, upon another, upon another. And with every drawing, more learning comes. So, so the idea of describing your knowledge in a single drawing is nonsense. You will never manage it. Um, it's true that a single drawing is sometimes what you're asked to produce in order to explain um, the knowledge that is contained by the drawing. But... Um, Two things um, contradict that. One is you can never say everything that you know. And secondly, the drawing can ever never say everything that you want it to say. And maybe there's a third point, which is there's no guarantee that whatever you think it says is actually understood by the reader anyway. So um, this montage theory of knowledge is really important. So I could stop the lecture here because that's really the point. But but that would be, that would be terrible because so I'm just going to therefore go on and develop um, this theory a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do three things from here. I'm going to just show you some pictures of the building that I'm interested in, this um, Finnish embassy. And then I'm going to show you some of the drawings that uh, Rema Pietrela did in the production of this building. And then I'm going to bring the drawings and the building together as a theorization. Um, Bear with me, I've got somebody just coming to my door in my office. <laughs> I'm just being interrupted. Um, Sorry. Okay, um, yeah, didn't know I was giving a talk. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, right, so now the building. So um, these are some of the early drawings um, and I put it into a context. So um, Pietla began this building in 1962, but didn't finish it until 1983. So a span of 20, 21 years. So that's a lot of thinking time and actually quite a lot of drawing time. So 21 years. Um, so one of the things that I really like to um, think about this building is that it spans quite a lot of the oeuvre of Rima Pietla. So as this building was in a sort of hiatus waiting for the instruction to build, it was also informing other projects of Rima Pietela. And Pietela used this phrase. So Pietela was an amazing theorist in his own right. I can't do justice to Pietela in this short presentation, but hopefully you'll get a flavour of why he's quite an important architect. When people think of Finland, they of course always think of Alvar Aalto. And Pietela comes after Aalto and tries to do something different from Aalto. But equally like Aalto is interested in making an architecture which um, meets the international um, um, audience but also speaks quite directly of it being Finnish. So it's simultaneously international, global and local. And um, just to kind of put into a, a bit of context some of these Nordic uh, Scandinavian architects who are operating a little bit later but um, than Pietela started but um, at the same time. So this is a reference to um, the Bagsveld Community Church in Denmark by Jorn Utzen. So you might know Jorn Utzen for his project for the Sydney Opera House. Um, and what you'll see is this kind of propensity within the Nordic um, architects to have references to the sky. And when you're up this far north, you'll understand why. Because the sky um, takes over the world between the, the ground, the earth and the sky, um, you have this mediation of architecture. And to a certain extent, that's what um, Pietela is talking about when he talks about the morphic interval of two amorphic zones. So there is the outside of a building and the inside of a building, and the building you could call a morphic interval, but in the continuity of the amorphic uh, landscape of earth and sky. So, and I interject this image, this is an image that you would not know necessarily, but this is a project that I did uh, way back in uh, 1990, 1993. Uh, this is um, an education building in Coventry, 
um, for a telecommunications business. Um, and the reason I put it in is because this is when I first engaged in Rima Pietela, because shortly, once we start, when we started this project in 1989, 1990, uh, Rima Pietela's project for uh, the Finnish embassy had just been published in the uh, British press. Um, and it influenced this project of mine uh, really greatly. And I have to say um, that uh, my version of this building is not anywhere as good as the bu this building um, that, of Pietela. Um, but I, I, I think I have to acknowledge the influence because I've been thinking about this building, Pietela, uh, since 1990. And I've only just published my paper in 2018. So um, you can work that out. So that's uh, 28 years of meditating on this building um, and um, trying to understand why I liked it so much. So here's the fundamental difference though. So this is Pieter, this building on the right, and this is my building on the left. And of course, I'm operating in England, not Scotland, but England. And um, I think that's a fundamental condition to how architecture is interpreted because the British perception, uh, the Anglo-centric perception, if you like, of the world um, has a kind of European tradition where it thinks of landscape as that which the building possesses. And um, so I'm afraid I was caught up in that same premise. So although I wanted to understand this building as being a building of the landscape, it's still, it's a little bit like Palladio's um, uh, Villa Imo, the, the little image you see in the bottom here, which is the Palazzo and simultaneously a working farm. And the whole point of that building is it addresses the countryside and says, I'm a Palazzo and a working farm, but everything before me is mine. That's my land. Yeah. Whereas um, Pietela's building is really nothing to do with power. It's, even though it's a Finnish embassy, and it was built along uh, at the exact same time as the French embassy and the Belgian embassy, which both operate as buildings of power. This is a building of landscape. And when I say landscape, I really mean of the landscape. So you have to therefore understand that uh, what Pietro was doing was that um, he was thinking the Finnish landscape and the Indian landscape as the same landscape. So this granite outcrop in uh, Finland, in Helsinki, is no different to the huge outcrops of rock of the Himalayas that can be seen from Delhi in 1962. You can't really see them anymore because Delhi has become so polluted, but at the time of this building being designed, you could see the Himalayas from Delhi. And so this landscape, this idea of the morphic, morphic interval of two morphic zones. So the building is this moment within this continuity of landscape. So this is the building. You can see it's quite an unusual building. You can, uh, its forms are, um, or in my use of the term gestures, are um, fundamentally landscape gestures, but also the designer's gestures. And I'll tell you more about this as I go on. So you're looking at, the ambassador's residence here um, and this is the ambassador's residence on the left and the, the um, residential wings um, below that and um, I usually always drop in a little image of Frank Gehry's projects um, because I think um, I like to uh, remind myself of what a metaphor should not be <laughs> so, um, when we're thinking of Pietrela's architecture as landscape, or architecture is landscape, then when we do things like architecture is a fish, um, I think it deadens the, the, and trivialises the idea of metaphor. So there are two definitions of metaphor that I like. So one is from... Um, a French philosopher called Paul Ricoeur, and he talks about the metaphor being um, simply a, a device where the incompatible 
makes the compatible more understandable and the compatible is made more strange by the incompatible coming into conversation with it. So when you see a fish, a building as a fish, and it's a fish, there is nothing, it's dead, it goes nowhere else, it's simply a fish. Whereas the ambiguities of this metaphor, this enrichment that metaphor brings, that Pietro's building brings, retains. And I'll tell you, I'll say more about that in a moment. And the second definition is um, from Gaston Bachelard, another French uh, philosopher, once upon a time scientist. Um, and he said that uh, a metaphor is just simply a linguistic device to make things understandable that would be otherwise difficult to understand. And I quite like that too. So this is the building by Pietro. I hope what you're kind of sensing is that there's um, uh, a sense of hierarchy going on between different elements. Um, you've got the stone walls and those stone walls are, from, are the stone, the local stone from the Deccan Plains of uh, India. Um, concrete but painted white because this is cloud, ice, snow. Um, Pietro calls this building, um, snow speaks on mountains. And uh, I don't know the Finnish language well enough to tell you more about that, but um, there are um, poetic devices in that tran in the original Finnish and the um, sonority of how you would say it in Finnish that I understand that are important. And of course, we know that snow doesn't speak and mountains don't speak literally. They can only speak metaphorically. And so there's a kind of language at play here where architectural language and word language um, start to um, speak to each other. And um, this is an important image because this is this, the Finnish ambassador here on the right. Um, and I would just like to say that if this was the UK embassy, there is no way that I would get to meet the UK ambassador. Um, I would be put into a great hierarchical system. Um, and probably meet some uh, civil servant very far down the line who may give me restricted access to certain things. But this is the Finnish embassy in India and they're a social democracy and all space is public space. That's an important political dimension. So there are lots of reasons to like this building. And just to re-invoke as I Think about it, that um, phrase by Guattari that I quoted, you know, the psyche and the body and the socius and the environment are the same thing. So this is an architecture which um, quite clearly, so I'm just going to shut my door. It's getting to the end of teaching. There's a lot of noise out the corridor. Um, yeah, so um, where the architecture um, is this embodiment of these three ecologies. And this is um, um, uh, um, a tropical landscape. So there is also the aspect that um, this architecture has to deal with monsoon. So the great snows of Finland are equivalent to the great rains of India. So these roofs are as much about capturing that wetness and distributing that wetness as they are about invoking that Finnish landscape or the ice caps on the Himalayas. And I want to show the inside of this and this same kind of sense of the underside of a roof is as important as the top side, as the side, as the elevation. Architecture is, you know, you would have to draw architecture in all its dimensions. You'd have to draw the roof, the ceiling, the ground, the walls. There are so many drawings. And um, when I get onto it, I'm going to show some of those drawings. But um, before I forget, one thing I ought to tell you is that uh, in the Pietala archive, um, there are thousands and thousands of drawings to do with this project. And I recognize them all because, as I said, when I was doing our version of a building, a bit like this building, of course, we too were doing thousands and thousands of drawings. And the kinds of drawings that you do 
are really important to understand as a research action, a research by design. So I'm probably at the point where I'm about to move into the drawings. So this is the, just to say, these are, this is inside the ambassador's residence. Um, very beautiful. Um, and like it ought to be, all the furniture and all the light fittings and all the um, paintings on the walls are, are, are of course Finnish, but the craftsmanship of the building is Indian. And that's another important thing. So those lovely teak windows um, built by uh, Indian craftsmen and the stonework by the Indian stonemasons. And you'll see that no two windows are the same size. And this is an understanding uh, between the architect and the craftsman and how important it is to understand that the, there is a one-to-one -one drawing that goes on, which is the building. So the windows, every piece of glass begins as a template and is a drawing and all the frames are um, drawings in themselves. And these are the residences for the uh, civil servants. And of course, like every lovely Finnish modern uh, building, even handles are designed, cupboards are designed. And of course, you always in Finland have a sauna. So this is myself in the archive, uh, as you can see, looking a bit happy that I'm looking at these drawings. Um, and this, I'm now going through the drawings. So you see these drawings, there's a, an amazing array of drawings. Drawings, anybody that's worked on a design of a building, should recognize these drawings. These are the drawings that you do, that you always usually throw away, throw in the bin, because they're not presentation drawings. However, I'm thinking about drawings as thought forms, as Denk Builder, i.e. movement images. And I'm thinking about these drawings as holding the gesture of the architect, holding the gesture of um, the, the context holding the gestures of the project. And I'll explain more about gesture in a moment. So even sketches like this, which are beautiful, drawings like this, sketches like this, beautiful drawings like this, and this, a particular favorite of, of mine because it looks just like one of mine. I think I drew that even though I never worked for Pietula. Um, I have done drawings like this uh, so many times. And even this, it's a kind of nothing drawing, it takes seconds, but when you're understanding this analysis, this, this interrogation of the architecture of underside of roof, top side of roof, structure of roof, you have to do drawings at times to just trace the path of your thinking. And when you draw it, you look at it and say, yes, like that, or maybe not like that. So, and even this drawing, I think it's a terrible drawing. However, it's a lovely drawing because you see it as this research of design, by design, through design. And it's not meant to be a question to be given to a client or whatever, but you see even there, this little section line and the question mark, it's a kind of thought. It's like, what are we doing at these edges? How do we detail these edges? How do we design these edges? How do we, we, it's not all about form. It's, it's about form, material, technology, and it's obviously about program. So all of these things have to um, coalesce. And it's obviously about environment. It's about sky, it's about ground. So I just love these drawings. These are kind of drawings you don't get to see very often, but are beautiful. So even thoughts like the light fitting. Personally, I really don't like that light fitting, but, I like the fact that the architect is thinking about the light fitting as an extension of this sense of the landscape and as a little mini extrusion within the landscape. Yes, yeah, so my project, here it is again. So I recognize those drawings because I did all these drawings for those kind of drawings for this building. So you can see the underside of the roof, the top side of the roof, all these little details, the, the way the stones work. Um, so I, I was doing these drawings for this building and I just think that's what architecture is. You know, 
I think it was Alberti that said, we don't make buildings, we make drawings of buildings. So we have to become experts in drawing. So whether it's a computer drawing or whether it's a hand drawing, whether it's a one-to-one -one drawing, whether it's the stonemason who draws across the stone before he cuts it, drawing is everywhere. And it's important therefore to understand those gestures, the fundamental condition of language within those gestures. So, okay, this is, I'm just gonna go a little bit theoretical um, and I'll make this, I hope, quite light because I don't want to go too far into it, but hopefully enough that you know that there is a great depth to this notion of design and the idea that design, drawing, research is a gesture, a very important kind of gesture. Um, and that therefore to take seriously the idea that design is research and science, but not because it's not poetic. It's deeply poetic and it's deeply linguistic and it's deeply about this coalescence between the psyche, the socius, and the environment. So, okay, so here's a few quotations that I think hold my place quite well. So what is gesture? So I'm, I'm invoking Wittgenstein, I mean, that curious man, Wittgenstein, a uh, deep philosopher who confuses everybody, but he has um, made a few statements on gesture, which are quite nice to um, understand. So he says, how curious, we should like to explain our understanding of a gesture by means of translation into words and the understanding of words by translating them into gesture. Thus, we are tossed to and fro when we try to find out where understanding properly resides. And we really shall be explaining words by gesture and gesture by words. So this lovely idea of being tossed to and fro. So even Wittgenstein, this logical positivist, as he's quite often uh, referred to, uh, he finds the idea of the being tossed to and fro an essential part of the logic of thought and bringing words to thought, or in our view, drawings as a kind of fundamental, early, original um, movement from uh, gesture, from fundamental conditions of thought to language. And that's where Agamben's phrase comes in. Gesture is not an absolutely non-linguistic element, but rather something closely tied to language. It is first of all a forceful presence in language itself, one that is older and more originary than conceptual expression. So we all know, I mean, I can't, I can't tell at the moment, I'm sorry you can, if you can see me on the screen, but I'm, I can't help but use my hands, right? I'm gesturing all the time. We always gesture um, and some aspects of our gestures get translated into symbols, into signs. I just found out uh, recently that the Chinese can count up to 10 on one hand. Um, so in the UK, we use two hands, but in China, they, they go from the one, two, three, four, five to six, seven, and I can't remember the race, nine, and then something of 10. They do it all in one hand. Um, and um, I think that's a kind of amazing thing. So gesture has got this sophistication about it, but it's also got this fundamental elementary condition. And then Wittgenstein again says, architecture is a gesture. But he also goes to say, not every purposive movement of the human body is a gesture. So because we move, doesn't make it gestural. It's when gesture becomes the movement into language, that's when it, when body moves into language, that's when it becomes gestural. When it's a thought process, when it's a mode of communication, then that's when it becomes language. And then Wittgenstein says this very interesting thing too, just as little as every functional building is architecture. So he's kind of pointing out that um, architecture also suffers from not understanding its role as language. It moves, it uh, facilitates movement, but if 
it doesn't rise to its challenge of being architecture, being gesture, then perhaps it's merely a kind of operational functionality of the building as body, not as communication. Now, it's not to say that that's necessarily an entirely negative thing, that there are those merely operational parts of buildings, but if it's all like that, then you can suddenly understand why architecture and building are often separated. And then, so this uh, lovely European um, come South American philosopher, Wilhelm Flusser, um, I think he moved to Brazil from um, Czechoslovakia um, and operated from Brazil most of his life. Um, he says, the world and life in it get an aesthetic meaning from the emotion-rich play of gesticulation. And Agamemnon says, an oeuvre, he thinks of an oeuvre, an architectural oeuvre, any oeuvre, as a constellation of gestures. So these are all very exciting things to me when I'm thinking about drawing. Um, so I said I was going to say something about thought images, Denk Builder. So this is uh, from Walter Benjamin. Um, and I like to see every single drawing as a thought image. Um, so the drawing on the left here is just a drawing that I made of Alvaro Alto's um, Culture Ritolo uh, in Helsinki, Finland. Um, and I wanted to draw it very empirically because I think in a sense that survey, that straightforward survey, that thing that architects do, only architects do, records those gestures. So even the gestures of others can be taken on by preparing your own drawings of them. So I got, I got to understand this building so much better just by drawing it. And of course, you can see the auditorium gestures differently from the offices uh, here. But the bit that I got really interested in was this canopy and this double structure. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous, that drawing. It's a little exploded isometric of the layers of the structure of the canopy. Um, I, I don't want to explain it here, but I just urge everybody to remember that to understand someone else's architecture you may have to draw it yourself and you know i don't know if there's any architectural historians in the audience um but i, I I'm, I'm afraid i'm going to make this little critique it's very unusual for an architectural historian to prepare drawings and therefore it's very unlikely that in an architectural historian's view of Rima Pietila, would you get anything of the narrative that I've just given you about Pietila? Because I think you have to really understand drawings to understand something of certain architects. And it might be why Pietila has, until recently, not been written about very much at all. Um, it's only recently that he's begun to be written about. And I think it's because maybe there are a few of us around who have begun to think and practice and speak like a research by designer and open up the possibility of how to talk about this kind of architecture. So here are a few more um, uh, snippets from uh, theory. Maybe the, one of the things that I'd like to say about the, um, the way that I'm presenting my screen is this horizontal band. Um, because um, whenever I give talks, I present it always this way because um, this is something of my own uh, research uh, method. Um, so I see these um, slots um, of um, presentation a bit like index cards. So what I do is I place things on it, things which I know are really interesting to me. Um, and I, I might use this card here for another lecture, another talk, another presentation. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm, um, I'm illustrating this montage theory of knowledge. I'm putting different knowledges together uh, to see how they begin to speak to each other. And so the whole succession of the cards is a kind of thought process. So I'm not reading from notes. I'm just reading from my index cards because my index cards stimulate my thinking. Um, and so they're a test if they work, actually. <laughs> so if I can uh, speak um, without um, referencing a script, then they seem to work. So I so these three uh, 
images. I'll call these images as much as I talk about the drawings as images. Um, and I think of them as drawings. Um, so the, the one on the left is by uh, uh, Agamben, and this is uh, from his essay Notes on Gesture. And it's the, the little one in the, 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 the middle and highlighted there. So he says, properly speaking, there are no images, but only gestures. And I, I sort of like that because what I'm reading there for in my index cards, I'm collecting gestures. They are just a collection of gestures. And um, I can't, well, um, the, the other two quotes are from um, uh, um, Walter, about Walter ben Benjamin and Adorno. Um, unfortunately, it's just escaped me who these uh, references are by. But anyway, they're about um, Walter Benjamin's notion of the Denk build as the thought image. Um, and maybe what uh, the main point of that first one is, it says here, art stands in need of philosophy that interprets, interprets it in order to say that which it cannot say, whereas art is only able to say what it says by not saying it. That's a kind of reiteration of the same thing that Wittgenstein was saying. So this is a sort of thing that when he says, Wittgenstein says, oh, um, of those things that we cannot speak, say nothing. Um, these are the kind of the strange um, psychological meanderings that we all go through um, when we're thinking but can't quite find the right mode of expression. Um, I contradict this by saying, and so does Benjamin by saying, that's exactly why you have to draw, because to draw it allows you to maybe think it and maybe even ultimately speak it. And sometimes, even in those drawings, the point is not to see it so directly. So if Pietela was to speak about his architecture through gesture all the time, I guess he would get sick of it, but also he would um, start to lose um, other aspects of that um, uh, project. He did talk about uh, the fact that he was trying to find a language by which to speak Finnish in architecture. So I think that's a kind of really uh, interesting statement. And um, maybe these are other just little snippets. Uh, and I could hear a couple of drawings from uh, some of my students when we were um, on a walk through um, a, a Polish city called Wrocław. Um, she produced these drawings of the, the city. Um, and these are thought images. So you have, for example, this bottom image um, what you might not know about this is that you get a plan here, which is um, was built by the Nazis in the Second World War as a bunker, but now is the Museum of Modern Art in uh, Wrocław. And so this kind of amazing um, idea that even the same plan of um, a military bunker can become a thought image to allow itself to become a Museum of Modern Art. I mean, how is that possible? And you could say that because of those gestures of the language of the military, where this sort of sense of protection and hermetic uh, seal, it lends itself to an interiority and intensification of the contemplation of art. So that's what somebody has thought and practiced by instituting it as a museum of modern art. But also, it shows how architecture can, through new gestures reappropriate old gestures. So I'm just wondering about my time. Um, so I think, so these are just a few more drawings. Um, so the, these elevational drawings of um, uh, the, 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 the building, which require you to course all the stone and detail all the windows and provide information to the builders in order to build it precisely are not so far away from these very early sketches. So there's maybe 20 years between these drawings. And it's lovely how gesturally they're the same, but how in detail, in precise language, they are different. And I think that's a really important dynamic of the gestural. So I just love how these drawings from the early years get translated to um, the, the later years. And as part of the paper that you might want to read if you're interested, I, I 
listed five categories of Rima Pietro's gestures. Um, it's not so important um, to elaborate too uh, at the moment, but what Pietro was, um, um, what, what he does, and actually what I do in my own projects, is title and name the project. So when he talked about the project as Snow Speaks on Mountains, the name was a gesture. The name was this gesture, which was simultaneously um, the originary thrust of language, but also the um, detailed elaboration of that language as more precise thought. Um, we can talk about figurative and abstract gestures, if you like, the, the, the way that the, um, uh, the, the, the ground and the building, the sky, the clouds, the, um, the way that um, the representational forces, if you like, of architecture are always in question and in play during the drawings. And if you keep them in play, you will retain their gestural condition. Again, the originary, but the sophisticated. So the movement from, again, in this one, from the sketch of 1962 to the sketch of 1980. Again, this, the open gestures um, of the landscape. Um, and this is, again, referring to uh, Flusser. We know this gesture. It is the gesture of reception, of taking in, of opening up to the future. So this openness of the architecture as it moves through time to the architecture of um, the early projects to the later project, we can change the project, but the gestures are consistent. And of course, the mediating, ge mediating gestures. So architecture mediates um, this morphic interval between uh, two amorphic zones um, and how the building and the drawing retain each other and therefore that gesturality um, is so important in this understanding of uh, the operation of research by design. Um, and maybe one final category which is that um, of other gestures and gestures of others. This is an infinite category that um, you know there are moments for example when you take that edicule where the window rather than just being a flat aperture in a, um, a cut in a wall it moves out and captures something of that landscape so something of that outer space is brought inside but also from the outside something of that inner space is brought outside so there's this kind of sense of um, reciprocity in this architecture where inside and outside um, Finland and India, the world of one people and the world of all peoples are actually in constant dialogue and open to each other. So this is a, a rather lovely um, gesture to me, I think, that this building operates. So maybe to conclude then, just to come back to drawing on, so the journal. So what we're trying to do um, is um, publish the research by design that enables us to publish all of this design stuff. So all the drawings. So on the web, it's much easier to um, show the galleries of drawings, lots and lots of drawings. And as I said, not to have text overshadow drawings, but neither drawings overshadow text. So there is this lovely reciprocity um, of thinking through drawings by drawings and thinking through text which for me is a kind of drawing also. So thank you very much I think I'll conclude there I hope that um, was um, comprehensible. Thank you Dorian that was lovely. Um, I myself uh, want to visit this building. <laughs> it would be impossible, but <laughs> um, a very inspiring tool because it gets to connect with many other things that perhaps um, one is thinking, right? And um, I want to say that time is so relative. Um, you know, the expanse of time is, is relative on these kinds of things. And I wanted to start with that question. 
Now for you, is timing a thing, you know, or, or not? Yeah. yeah. Well, so, um, so one of the things that um, I articulate in my uh, essay in the Nordic Journal of Architectural Research is um, that very point that um, um, the notion of research itself as a gesture that moves forward. So it's not about um, making the future um, an aspect of history, but it's about bringing history into the future because the future is um, a really important um, gesture in its own right. You know, Wilhelm Flusser says, um, you know, architects used to be considered um, as um, predictors of the future. We predict the future. I like that notion, we predict the future. So by understanding the past and the present, we can predict the future. And this is why I say um, research by design is a trans-historical modality. So I say that like Walter Benjamin, who I'm taking this notion from, um, and there's lots of people who confirm their um, belief in this same idea. Um, so what we mean by trans-historical is that we see history as, as and, and therefore time as neither progression nor decline. So we're not looking to the future as a decline of a glorious past, nor are we looking to the future as a progression away from an ignorant history. So it's a continuity. It's a continuity. So that's why looking to Pietela and his gestures, I'm kind of looking to his gesture of futurity and this sense of modernity not being about an idiomatic concern of architecture, but an architecture that gestures forward. As I say, not about progression nor decline, but just forward because we are predicting the future and leaving the now for those who are yet to come. And this is an important gesture. Mm, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm gonna open uh, some of the questions that we, we have received um, thus far and uh, encourage everyone to uh, plop in any questions in the Q&A um, below. Um, so I'll start uh, with uh, Gabriela's question and she said and she says hello Dorian since the ambiguity of the metaphor applied in architectural gestures offer the possibility of reading into and discovering its meaning by through by thought and experience sometimes the need is to express a specific intention and not an ambivalent one how to approach the metaphor in these gestures as a semiotic device with a message that is clear to its reader? Does it have to be clear, I, I want to add? Okay, um, so thank you, Gabriela, for your question. Um, so I, I like the question um, because it's a difficult question because um, it brings out the other question of purpose. What's our purpose? What is the purpose of architecture? What is the purpose of design? And I think um, there is um, an important um, aspect of architecture where purpose may be to change things and change things specifically because things are not so good in specific situations. You know, um, but as I was kind of pointing out from that tiny little example that I gave just very fleetingly about the bunker in um, Wrocław, um, and I could even point to Paul Virilio's work uh, on the bunkers in France, the Atlantic bunkers in France, and um, his project uh, for the church, which takes its language from the bunkers. So the semiotic device to kind of recharge something um, like military bunkers with a, a program 
like a church, so spiritual. I mean, this is, I think, um, teetering on the brink between heresy and enlightenment. And I think that tension between heresy and enlightenment is something that uh, the semiotic devices can, can do. But I would argue though that if you're trying to get a specific interpretation rather than a specific intention, then I think um, then there's no guarantee that that's ever going to come out. But maybe the chances of um, operating a, um, a recharge, a reappropriation um, of things by understanding the semiotics of a particular language, of a particular expression. Yeah, I think that's possible. And so metaphor, um, I think, is appropriate. Um, but I again, I would say, if you want it to be a fish, then I think you're going to deaden the metaphor and the semiotic charge. But if you want it to have a, a sense of a yet to come, then I think you need something of um, um, a different kind of language. So I, I, I would probably um, say here that my particular preference is not to engage in such limited purposefulness, but to understand the sense that one of the aspects that um, architecture, art, any of the creative uh, modes can do is that it can give a sense of purpose through its own purposiveness without specifically applying a very limited idea of purpose. So I think um, uh, Pietula's building could easily become a hospital, a kindergarten, a school, um, residences, but it's kind of residences already. Um, so it seems to me that the architecture could work semiotically for all these different programs. So if your intention um, gets overly prescriptive, then there's a danger that your semiotics become dull. Um, I think the semiotic charge of architecture and the metaphorical charge of architecture can be one and the same thing, but you have to be careful. Um, and I think maybe I would refer to if we are thinking about semiotic, we could talk about Roland Barthes and his third meaning. And I would maybe allude to that possibility in semiotics. I don't know if that answered your question, Gabriella. I hope uh, I've, I've, I've done a job on answering. I think so. <laughs> Should we move to the second one? Um, Julia um, asks, would you consider gesture drawing is more related to an empirical way of thinking or even phenomenology rather than with the reality itself? So um, again, another interesting question. Thank you, Julia um, or Julia. Um, so uh, gesture drawing. So I would say that all drawing is gesture. Um, so, but maybe not everybody who draws thinks of their drawing as gesture. Um, so I, I'm bringing this sense of the gestural to drawing to make a point, which is that um, drawing is this um, um, means to communicate. Um, it's a means to communicate. We know that because um, if you like, our architectural drawings as we prepare for a builder are instructions. So drawings as instructions. But then when we're in the design research period, um, maybe those drawings are um, not so much instructive, but maybe just questioning. So um, whether you're drawing um, wobbly lines or straight lines um, or shading or lines or curves or lines or whatever the um, drawing is engaging with, um, then it's got a critical dimension an inquisitive dimension. Um, so it is related to an empirical way of thinking, but it is not exclusive um, to empiricism, but neither is it exclusive to the phenomenology of the drawing. So if you like, if the empirical is talking about an experience of measure and precision, 
whereas phenomenology is talking about the experience of effect, then I don't see that each are in contradiction with the other. And I would say that the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the um, yeah, they're just not in contradiction. They're one and the same. So reality, so the idea that reality is um, either an empirical thing or a phenomenological thing, it seems to me that reality is all of these things. And so the, the, the drawing is reality. Um, the building is reality, but there may be different realities, but they speak of uh, an overlap in reality. Um, so I, I wouldn't be exclusively phenomenological or exclusively empirical. I think um, I love our empirical traditions as an architect. I love being so measured and so precise, but I love also the um, the list of effects, if you, if you like, that a phenomenology brings. Um, the, 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 the being in that phenomenology speaks of um, in the way that empiricism maybe creates a distance away from. But I think you can be in um, empiricism as much as you can be in the uh, ontological. Mm. Wow, that's really nice. I think um, when you say building, uh, like the, the drawings for buildings as instructions um that's like a fundamental difference you know than from the uh, as drawing uh, by gesture would you let like elaborate that you know that phase where you like sort of stop and then i'm gonna make these instructions you know like what is happening there okay um so i think I, I'm going to say that the the, um, the instructive drawings are no less gestural than uh, the drawings of inquisition. So I would say, um, but the, there is a different purpose, if you like, to the role of gesture. So in the instructive drawings, the gestures ought to be less ambiguous <laughs> than the drawings that maybe are at the inquisitive stages because um, I remember a phrase from my own practice where if it's, uh, if it's um, confusing to me as the architect, it's mud to the builder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so there comes a point where clarity is necessary. But, you know, a lot of the drawings that you do for instruction, you can issue as pre preliminary instructions because they may be the mode to inquire of the builder how best to build. So therefore they set up a chain of communication. So the idea that uh, the drawings of instruction are some sort of top down um, uh, process of authority is um, perhaps maybe the wrong way to see the drawings of instruction. I would say that I would hope for the opportunity to, in to engage all people in the process of building into the inquisition of instruction. <laughs> Yes, and I think uh, in drawing, uh, it's important to highlight, you know, like it never really, like your way of thinking and the process of it doesn't or should never stop unless you say, okay, well, the building is now done. You know, like do you know, drawings come along until the very end of the building being built, you know, because yes. never really is uh, done or fully built i think you know no no that's right so i i mean um so just before covid <laughs> when we were allowed to travel um i traveled down to cambridge um um for a short break and i visited a building um that i finished work on i.e i finished my drawings uh in 1990 um but I never got to see two things uh, before I moved back to Scotland. So I never saw, so it was a church. I never saw the organ and I never saw the altar. Um, so it was really nice to go down and see how these drawings had been interpreted. And um, I'm afraid um, I broke the door of the organ. <laughs> <laughs> 
because they built it not according to my drawings and I tried to open it the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, I should have been a little bit more delicate when I was opening the door. Um, and, uh, and it was just as fine. How they did it was just as good as I intended, um, but it was just different. So I, I, I split a little bit of wood because it was on a catch that I didn't know was there. Um, and I had to go and tell the, the people that I, I damaged the organ. Um, but it was easily fixed, don't worry. Um, anyway, so what I'm trying to point out by that is that, so the drawings continued even after my drawings were finished. And uh, so the drawings were done by the organ builder and the altar builder. And so it is. And, you know, um, one day that building is going to be refurbished. The lights, I remember designing the lights. I think they need to come out and be redone because LEDs are much better, much more ecologically sound. Um, and I am embarrassed to think of how difficult the lights will be to change. Um, every time they need to change a light bulb, they have to erect a scaffold. So um, I, I created a very difficult maintenance regime um, in that chapel. So I think that um, the drawing project never finishes. Um, and uh, I know that um, architects have come in and built in the context of that building. So they haven't done anything to the building, but they've built adjacent to it. So they will have redrawn the building again anyway, in order to work out their buildings. And so it is, you know, when we design anything that usually we begin with a survey. Yeah. And that survey is a new drawing of someone else's architecture. So I think the drawing is interminable. And thankfully, that is the case. That's nice. That, that, that for me, um, allows me to say, when I look to the building that um, I built, which was inspired by Pietula, I'm not ashamed of it in the slightest, um, but it records a kind of thought process of the time. And um, my thought processes matured, changed a little. And I was working for another practice. It wasn't my own practice. So I was, my boss was telling me to make it English. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years, 28 years later. <laughs> Um, I wanted to go ahead and uh, ask Martin's question, and uh, he says, can you expand in the topic of reappropriating old gestures with new ones? Is this a way to introduce the idea of thought drawing into the digital driven drawing age? Uh, yes, that's a good question and a good answer. You answered your own question very well, I think. Um, I. I really like um, how the digital as um, an overtly virtual medium questions reality. And my argument is that the virtual is no less real than the real. So the task then becomes, how do you appropriate the virtual into the real and the real into the virtual? And that is a new um, um, period of thinking, if you like, that has been accelerated by the digital. So, but it's not unique to the digital. So I would say that, um, so my own practice bridges the digital uh, turn, if you like. Um, so um, the first buildings I was building uh, were not done on computers, they were all done by hand. Then. Um, the, the building that I just showed you in this uh, lecture was one of the very first digital um, um, production um, uh, system for me. So you, the, the drawing that I showed you was a digital drawing, but that was 1990, that drawing. So that's, that's a very old computer um, and a very slow drawing process. What you can do now is amazing. Um, but I, I will invoke um, Raoul Boonshorten, who um, is this uh, very wonderful Dutch architect. Um, when he came to visit this school, um, he said, be careful about these computers. Um, you have amazing equipment. And most of, you, most of us use this equipment very badly. And he said, it's like having um, a Lamborghini or a Maserati and just using it to go around the corner to fetch a pint of milk. So this 
these machines can perform in really amazing ways and we should experiment on how they can perform and then how they affect reality. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have gone from pre-digital, digital, the parametric turn, and now the computational turn. And each of them, I think, offer uh, amazing insights into um, the thoughts and processes and um, uh, future of reality, if you like. But you have to be careful that, that um, reality is not um, premised on gesture that is, as Wittgenstein said, that um, devoid of language and devoid of criticality and leaves itself as empty gesture. That would be very sad. So don't make architecture like a pint of milk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a nice um, metaphor. <laughs> Um, I I wanted to go back to the moment where you um, where you said this is a nothing drawing, you know, yeah. um, and to me that's very powerful because um, and maybe connecting to Martin's um, you know idea of the digital, you know, when in the digital the nothing drawing really is nothing because it can also disappear you hit delete and you know but the nothing drawing in a physical sort of um stance what does that mean and like how does that uh, you elaborated on the question mark and all that stuff but for you like in your process or perhaps when you see that your students that nothing drawing what what does it mean so, okay, so I, I, I would say that um, I don't know if everybody goes through this kind of experience, but this is my experience and I see it so often in my students. So there is such a preciousness about drawing. You know, a student makes a drawing, I make a drawing, and the last thing on earth I want to do is change it because I want it to be perfect, I want it to be right. and. I try, I go into a process of denial <laughs> and um, I, I don't want to change the drawing. So what I say and what I learned at one point is that, you know, if I don't change that drawing, it's going to be a nightmare on site. It's absolutely going to be a nightmare because the error that's embedded in that drawing, the mistake, the conceit of my own embarrassment is going to multiply tenfold on site. So <laughs> better that I do another drawing now when I can, because it's only me that does the drawings. The architect is the only person that does the drawings, right? Engineers do drawings, of course. Um, all your engineers do drawings, but nobody does the drawings like the architect. We're the ones that do all those silly drawings again and again and again and again. The engineer wants to say, just tell me once, don't let me design with you because then I start losing money left, right and center, right? So they don't want to engage in the same process that you do. So you have to take on the burden of the errors. And once you get into that kind of realization that it's very easy to draw again, then um, it's very easy to produce these nothing drawings. That's why I call them nothing drawings. It's nothing. It's no burden to do these drawings, really. It's actually quite nice. And actually, sometimes they just take a second, you know? Um, you know, with in, in the digital, to talk about the digital, you know, it's so easy to duplicate a drawing and then put it in as an extra layer and just change one bit of it and then play with the kind of the changes against the original by just shifting the layers. It's so easy. There are means, you know, and in the old days, it used to be tracing paper on top of each other. But in the machine, you can do it with this other sense of um, flexibility, but simultaneous precision. And you need practice in those processes too. You need practices. So you need to keep storing your files. You need to back up your files. You need to um, name your files so importantly so you can rev make revisions A, B, C, D, whatever it is, or revision metaphor one, revision metaphor two, you know. So you have to name all your drawings and all your sketches. And I can see that, um, is it Maurizio? Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, so should every single drawing doodle sketch we do as a, a document for the future interpretation? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but you know, you don't have to be precious about them, but you can store them, file them, and have them to hand. You know, in the process of things, perhaps we're not always sure which is the best drawing. Maybe you have to do 10 and then you find out it's number six is the best one and you have to go back, you know, but maybe you don't know that until you've done seven, eight, nine, and 10. Yes, so you answered that yeah. question quite. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's very straightforward, you know, like draw as much as you can and yeah. then that speaks to you. That's your sort of language, right? And yeah. to, to Mauricio's question, I wonder, like, is there like an intention, you know, behind saving up all these drawings? Perhaps there is no intention. They got saved up because by chance, you know, by for fortune. Um, is so, so different people have different views on those things. So, um, and it depends in your life, right? Whether you're an academic, whether you're a practitioner, whether you're working for somebody or working for yourself, working in a team, I would just say there is no harm in keeping these drawings. There's no harm. It's easier to keep them sometimes than throw away. Now, if you're throwing them away, it kind of presumes that what you're doing is disliking them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I tend not to offer that judgment on, on drawings. I would just, now, of course, Every now and then you have a clean out and you say, well, you know what, I don't really want to keep these. Um, but there are some that you that become very important to you because they're sort of memories. They're memories of thoughts. They're articulations of um, a past notion of futurity. And this becomes a really important part of your now futurity. So I would say um, there's no harm to keep them. And if um, why, why, why dispose of them? Um, but, you know, I know I know of some people that keep their drawings because they think they're building up their um, future uh, autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I personally don't really like that idea um, because these drawings are one day going to be really important. Um, I don't think that's the point. I think that, um, you know, uh, going back to Pietela, the reason that these drawings have been kept is because um, the project was live, not just to the project, but to other projects in the office. So every project feeds another project. So it's not a linear straight through from the beginning of uh, a project to the end of a project. As I said, that continues. So maybe 10 years later, five years later, you get a new project, which might want to refer to some of that. So actually, Go look at your drawings and re-inspire yourself. Beautiful. Um, Emilia asks, hi Dorian, sometimes I find it difficult to explain the concept of my project with drawings. So the question is, how can we make sure that our thoughts or ideas translated into drawings are clear enough so that the other, that the other person can understand them just by looking at the drawing without having to explain in words? Um, this is another nice question, but a question that um, recurs over and over again. Um, so I, ha I have a way of answering it, um, but it might not be adequate, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, so I think you go wrong when you say you find it difficult to explain. I would say there is absolutely no need to explain. And if you're doing a drawing, to explain, you're not necessarily doing the drawing correctly. So explanation is a word that comes out of a juridical tendency. Explain yourself, explain yourself. It's a very authoritarian command. I would prefer, and I say this to my students, don't explain yourself, just describe beautifully through your drawing. Just make it description. And description is really up to you how you want to describe it. You know, so if it's just description, just describe the thing. So the drawing is a drawing in its own right. It describes itself. 
And if you're describing the space, the um, structure, the materials, the shadow, the light, um, the qualities, then that description comes through as description. If someone is looking for an explanation as to why did you do that, then I think they may not be asking the right question. I would say start with the question, what, how, and why might come afterwards. Mm -hmm. I, um, Dorian, you have to come down to, to Ecuador and um, look at our drawings. <laughs> um, I'd love to see some drawings. That would be amazing. Um, I think I, I wanted to ask a question of my own. Like you, you showed us uh, some, I don't know if they're etchings or paintings of Pietola, right? Yeah. Um, but in your work, does, does that translate as well? Like, do you paint, do you etch, do you, how, yeah. how do you work your first phases sort of those processes? Yeah, it's a good question again. Um, so I, I would say, so I will just reiterate that everything is a drawing for me. Yeah. Um, not because one thing I better just point out from the outset, I don't consider myself an artist. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, engage with artists quite a lot. Um, and I know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> course is an overlap right there is an overlap there is a certain amount of artistry in what an archi architect does but it's not art I mean I love the fact that architecture has some other dimension than art you know art is this um, if you like something which is about existential crisis if you like um, and um, wants to delve into um, really deep um, physical, mental um, uh, questions. And I think architecture is the same, but the fundamental difference is that um, it's something that maybe has a purpose beyond the autobiographical uh, existential crisis. <laughs> so, um, it, and that's a, that's a very useful thing for me so in answer to your question, therefore, of why I say that everything is a drawing is because um, I, I allude to the fact that it's on the road to becoming architecture, right? And so, yes, I paint. Uh, I make drawings in wax. I make drawings in clay. Uh, I make drawings in glass. Um, I uh, make them in wood and steel. Um, and I use all sorts of material to make drawings. And um, for me, this is always um, a means. So technique of drawing is a really important part of the question of what a drawing needs to do in order to open up the architecture. And so sometimes when I don't know how to begin, um, i.e. what I need to do to make this architecture for this project be something, I might just begin to put materials together. And sometimes um, I would choose the simplest possible materials, the most effective. So this could be sand on the beach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, everybody draws in the sand, right? And why not? Um, this could be the spilling of paint. This could be the dropping of flour for making bread onto glass. So and then shifting it with developing tools to draw. It really depends upon um, the kind of inquiry that I think appropriate to the kind of context I'm operating in. Mm. We live in the Highlands, so sand is eight hours away, but uh, we can build our own sandbox at school. <laughs> <and> can <laughs> can draw then, on sand. <laughs> so the Highlands, I mean, so, um, so some of the things that you might have to hand, um, which are very beautiful to draw with too, uh, is the, the very landscape that you have, you know, so whether it's from the trees, the plants, um, I, I think there are all sorts of kinds of drawings that um, are possible. And look, I mean, when people come into my studio, 
they can sometimes be astonished by what they see because they think, hey, an architecture studio shouldn't look like that. But actually, um, I convince them that, wait, there will be some really beautiful architectural drawings from the conventional empirical tradition emerging, but not necessarily yet. Um, it might not be the easiest way to begin by imagining how to draw a building. You know, maybe you have to draw an effect. You know, I was asked the question earlier about the relationship between empiricism and phenomenology, you know, so maybe you begin with pure phenomena, you know, pure atmosphere, pure, you know, um, one of my research themes is wetness. Yeah, because I mean, maybe this is appropriate to your landscape, but in Scotland, it's very wet at times, right? And, you know, the tradition of um, registering um, water is when uh, the cartographer is uh, willing to go out in the dry to measure the, the the extent of the river, right? So actually, most of the representations of the world are a representation of the the the, the good weather rather than what they call the bad weather. Um, and I would just maintain there's no such thing as bad weather. There is only bad representation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we. Um... It's funny because we live in an eternal springtime here, and so we so we we live in, in this illusion of good weather, but very much so. So, for us to have like one week of rain is like, oh my god, what's going on, you know? And for you guys, it's nothing. It's like normal. But anyway, I love this conversation, and maybe. Um, I'm not sure how is your time and we'll end up on a last question. I don't know if Ana Maria has a question. Uh, more than a question, I just wanted to thank you because we're running out of time. Uh, Dorian, I think it, it was such inspiring, your lecture. Um, mainly because, I, I don't know, for me, it began like to uh, a lot of, of thinking uh, about how is gesture a human action and actually becomes architecture. And uh, how I, I think that what I get from all of this process is that patience is like a virtue in architecture. So patience has to be part of the process and it takes time, even years. And um, I think that that part is, is, is really interesting and relevant right now when we actually need everything to be done really quickly. And we have to have everything resolved like in minutes. So I think, um, I think it's a, I mean, for me, it was like a, a or what you left with your 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 lecture is uh, how interesting is like architecture has to have its own time and the process it, of of gestures and, and I don't know uh, of the semantics and everything evolves uh, in time so it, it it reaches like a maturity so um, I think um, I, I think a lot of questions arose from there. So thank you so much for, for being here with us. It was a pleasure and a delight really to, to hear you. Uh, and we really hope uh, in the near future, you can come to South America and to Ecuador and, and we can meet and you can have like a real seminar. Uh, uh, it will be really an honor for us. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. And uh, certainly when I hear the description of a perpetual springtime, I definitely want to come. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's the best way to sell our country. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, it is like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds thank lovely. you, Dorian. It was well, thank lovely. You. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And good luck with everything that you uh, continue to do. And uh, well done for setting up this lecture program. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. Have a good night. And you too. I'm off into the dark. <laughs> yeah, we can see that. <laughs> right. Bye. Bye. Gracias.